Great. So I'm the non-information management speaker. Um, so my job here is really to provide some of the kind of bigger global context to how different people are approaching the issues really that Liz Tidd was talking about in terms of how to shift governance and governments um, to be more open, to engage citizens more, to be, to be more accountable. Um, so the first thing to say, and Liz said it way better than I could, is to say that you know, open government is kind of nothing new in that it taps into long traditions, practices and philosophies around democracy and around participation and that there have been various governments in various places um, that have been doing that in different ways for very long periods of time. And also a lot of social movements, civil society and others who have kind of pushed the door open in a lot of places. Um, so I was thinking about what we mean by open and then also what we mean and some kind of concrete examples of how the global movement is thinking about open by design. So in the formal open government partnership, which 79 countries, including Australia, have joined, to join they need to sign up to this open government declaration and they also need to have kind of foundational laws and policies already in place, such as freedom of information. Um, and when they're talking about open then, it goes beyond transparency and access to information because it also entails civic participation and engagement, integrity and accountability, and also the kind of strong focus now on how to use new technologies to empower people to deliver services more effectively and to strengthen accountability and the use of information. Um, so I think, you know, for this group in particular, the reality is that your expertise is critical not just to the first aspect of that in terms of transparency and access to information, but how to actually make that information meaningful, usable, accessible in the right ways to enable the participation, engagement and the accountability. Um, so these are kind of the countries that are already involved, as I said, the 79 countries in the Open Government Partnership. And increasingly, the partnership is also opening up to state and local governments. So there are already 20 governments at that kind of sub-national level who have joined and who are, who are working together with civil society on their own innovations. Um, and that's likely to kind of open up further over the next couple of years. And so I wanted to talk about a few stories of how they're doing open by design. So within the open government kind of movement globally, I think we think about open by design in a couple of ways. So at the very big picture level, we think about it as the process that sits behind all open government. So as Liz Tid again said, that process is actually about at the level of the government's plans and strategies for open government, that those are a product of co-creation, engagement, collaboration between government and civil society or between government and citizens. So especially at the local, say the city level, Often that's a much more direct engagement with citizens. As you kind of go up to the federal level and you often are dealing with those broad-based reforms, which might be, for example, the current debate we're having about the need for a federal integrity and anti-corruption commission, um, you're often getting to the level of an engagement much more between civil society and government than necessarily you know, directly with citizens. Um, but that kind of design process as being not just having government in the driver's seat, so this is not just a government agenda, but that at the level of the agenda and what it is you know, that the government plans to do, that there is already that engagement is, I think, a crucial piece of Open by Design. And then the other piece goes to what Sonia was talking about, which is how do you make sure that openness is driving towards things that really matter to people and that people really care about? So while all of those um, broader based reforms, you know, we know that we need the legislative frameworks around freedom of information. Um, we know that we need certain forms of transparency, but we also know that there is a lot of transparency that isn't used. Um, and part of that is about the capability on the other side to use it. And part of that is about the fact that it's a broad based kind of dump of information um, that's not targeted to where, what people really need to know in a way where they can then use it for a purpose. So a few examples of how people are, are doing open by design in ways that are very 
kind of grounded and relevant to people's lives. Um, in Austin, Texas, at the city level, you've got a situation of um, really historically grounded inequities that come out of significant racial segregation in that city and that have led to very long running um, inequities in terms of access to services and access to economic opportunities. Part of what they've done through their open government process is that they've gone through a process of working with 25 government departments and 43 local organisations to design a process to actually assess their programs and their budgets by their impact on disadvantaged communities. So they created an equity assessment team, which was government and civil society. They created a tool and they tested it out in the community. And it's now being used very actively by government departments to actually bring those considerations into government early on. Part of what's interesting about that example is that the chief equity officer, who obviously had a political mandate, she'd had an office set up, she was in place, but she had, I think, one other staff person. So she knew that she needed to engage the community to develop something that was credible, that was valid, that would actually be work and be meaningful. But also she actually knew that she didn't have the resources to do this on her own as government. So literally the only way they could get this done was to bring in others and draw on resources from outside. And I think we increasingly see that where there is a kind of clear purpose, often one that the community is vocal about demanding, um, and you have leaders within bureaucracy or within the political level who can see that actually they can't get this done on their own, that's a really fertile ground for the kind of collaboration and openness that can lead to the, the significant kind of cultural change that you can have in a government like a city. So a second example um, that is slightly more information based um, is what they've done in Buenos Aires in Argentina around improving people's access to sexual and reproductive health services. So in that case, they already had a legislative framework that said everybody in the city has the right to access quality sexual reproductive health services. But in reality, the services in different parts of the city were of very different quality. Often people didn't know where they could access HIV testing, where they could get condoms, where they could have you know, STI testing, where they could see a doctor. Um, and they had a, a civil society group that was a health foundation that had been working on these issues in different ways and that saw the open government process as an opening where they could work with government in a different way. And what they've created is a digital platform for people across the city to find the services that they need much more easily and also to provide feedback on them. And so to have that feedback loop about quality where the city is then able to work in a much more targeted way with services that are, that are subpar. So again, it's very purposeful in terms of the aim around access to health services. They were also facing a rise in HIV infections in young people, so very targeted to getting young people into services that they needed. Um, and then very much based on this openness to collaboration between civil society and government, as well as a government, so Buenos Aires has really invested in open government and they have you know, strong leadership you know, and, and strong resourcing. So lastly, a very different kind of example, um, but again about this combination of the, the transparency and access to information combined with these processes of engagement that make it work, is the case of the Ukraine, um, which is always a nice um, kind of surprising example as a leader in a part of open government. Um, but after the Maidan revolution, there was a group of civil society, business and reformers who'd come into government who wanted to reform the completely corrupt system around government contracting. So they were losing huge amounts of money. There was no credibility in the systems. So they also couldn't attract new businesses to bid on business, you know, on contracts, which meant that they ultimately weren't getting good providers to actually deliver services, to actually build infrastructure. So they created a system called Prozoro, which is a, an, you know, an online system for all contracts. So not only is the bidding and tendering process online, but actually all government contracts 
are also online, so can be monitored by anybody. And the government was starting to save significant money just through that, right, and their own ability to monitor it. But then civil society worked out, well, the government actually doesn't have the resources to do all the monitoring that's needed here of government contracts. So they created a kind of secondary system called Dozoro, and they went round the country and trained citizens, civil society groups, businesses in how to monitor government contracts. And out of that, they've got this kind of distributed network of monitors. So they've had 14,000 reports submitted, feedback on contracts. 5,000 of those have become cases. 1,200 of those have led to changes in the tender. And you've had actual you know, prosecutions also coming out of it. So it's, it's supporting much greater Effectiveness, they've saved over a billion dollars. Um, they've increased trust and competition significantly, but also, you know, they've actually, they've actually kind of shifted the way people feel about the whole system. So all of these reforms have led to really concrete changes in these countries, and all of them speak to some of the things that we see across the open government movement about when does this work? Um, and it speaks to some of the points that Sonia raises. I think, you know, the naming and shaming doesn't tend to work. There's actually a bit of a, a movement starting around naming and faming um, instead. So much more of a kind of celebration of leadership around these issues. But I think that some of the crucial combinations are where you do get a kind of strong demand from community or from civil society but where that's matched by a level of commitment, understanding, leadership in bureaucracy, sometimes at political levels as well, sometimes without the political support, actually. There's a huge amount that leaders at lots of different levels in government can do within, within this kind of framework and movement. Um, so, and I just want to say also in response to Sonia's piece about kind of what are the things that are motivating. We've also been learning about different um, ways that governments are finding to actually incentivise some of these processes. So for example, the government of Jakarta linked additional budget that departments could access to the speed at which they responded to citizen complaints. And they much, you know, they reduced by almost 80% um, the delay in responses to citizen feedback and complaints across the city. And that was a, you know, it's not a punitive thing, it's just if you want that extra, you know, access to an extra 10% of your budget, you better actually be responding to, to what citizens are telling you. So here in Australia, we've got a kind of interesting and a bit of a mixed history, as Sonia pointed to, around, around open government. So in some ways, we have a very long history of openness on some things, you know, so say in the area of government contracts, since Federation, the government's been gazetting, literally publishing in the newspaper, when it signed a contract with an entity. Um, so in many parts of the world, that, that was seen as a huge, you know, leading practice. Um, but in many ways, that's been kind of outstripped even by countries like Ukraine, where now as a citizen, you can access much more information actually about government contracts. Um, and of course, in our current context when we're dealing with Watergate and the Manus Security Contract and the Great Barrier Reef Foundation, I think there's a lot of people who think, well, actually, kind of the digital gazetting that the government does is no longer enough for us to really be assured that these deals are done properly and with integrity and that public money, you know, is necessarily being spent well. So, so in Australia, where, you know, that, that history is a great base to grow off but also requires kind of ongoing vision and commitment for how to make that system better. And I think we can get into a state of some complacency about our kind of democratic institutions and that they don't really need, you know, improving. Um, so the, the good news about the way in which Australia has started to engage with this movement, here in New South Wales, the government was the first government in Australia to adopt an open government policy explicitly. Um, and that's fed into some work that Mel's going to talk about, about transparency of mining licences. It's even fed into things like TripView that no doubt we all use to get around with uh, open data from Transport for New South Wales. Um, and also the kind of more potentially citizen-focused um, 
you know, approach to, to service delivery in the state. At the federal level, the federal government signed up to the Open Government Partnership in 2015 and has just finished at the end of last year the second National Action Plan. Um, so the process for developing action plans in Australia has involved some level of consultation. There is a open government forum, which I'm now on, which is half government, half civil society, which kind of oversees the process and in a sense negotiates the plan. But we're still at pretty early stages, I'd say, of building that dialogue and especially building the engagement so that it goes beyond a pretty small group of people. So we're kind of pretty early on in the spectrum of public participation. Um, and I think that is partly due to issues on both sides. So I'd say at the federal government level, um, we've got some pretty outdated approach to what public engagement is um, that is very focused on giving information or maybe seeking feedback on a draft paper that you release on a Friday night and need feedback on pretty quickly. Um, and, and so there's not a lot of capability and actually there's a lot of risk aversion and fear, I'd say, in a lot of the federal public service about opening things up to the public. And this is something that the recent Australian Public Service Review has spoken about as a kind of key issue to be addressed in making the government more open and accountable. And then on the civil society side, we kind of have a much more nascent field around government accountability and transparency than a lot of other countries. There are fewer organisations that are focused directly on it, that are resourced to work on it. And so we've got a, a good civil society network, but I would encourage any of you even as interested citizens to join the Open Government, the Australian Open Government Civil Society Network, because it's kind of you know, it's through other people coming and bringing their energy that that's going to grow and that there's going to be a kind of deeper, a deeper engagement. So the two action plans we've had have had a lot to say, though, about information management. So this was the first action plan and it covered things like releasing high value data sets. It covered um, information management and access laws for the 21st century and that's also fed into the new data sharing frameworks um, and legislation that's going through at the federal level. And it had a lot of focus on accessibility of government data. Um, this new action plan kind of continues the trend. You can see they really rolled back the ambition, not all of these commitments, just a few things. Um, so improving the sharing use and reuse of public sector data Liz Tidd is leading this work to engage states and territories to better understand information access. And then also work Mel and I have been involved in, in expanding open contracting. So again, around the accessibility of government, government contracts um, and data. So I think part of the main message for all of us in Australia is that, you know, the time is fairly ripe. There has been this establishment of a process through which governments and now multiple governments can come together with civil society and actually be proactive, be purposeful about open government by design in Australia. And the time is also right because I think the public is both disillusioned by the kind of gaps that we're seeing in the integrity systems and the transparency and the engagement of our government and are also kind of crying out for a more meaningful and substantive way to engage. So I would certainly encourage all of you to think about how you can bring your expertise on information management to bear in thinking about how we actually embed meaningful transparency and as many of you said, like meaningful accessibility so that people can really be using information coming out of government for things that really matter to them. So thank you, I'll leave it there. Oh yeah, well my question and then...